Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you to the 13th meeting of the CSG National Long-Term Care Workforce Network. Uh, I'm Sean Sloan, I'm a senior policy analyst at the Council of State Governments uh, National Headquarters office here in Lexington, Kentucky. A look at our uh, agenda uh, and uh, our great lineup of, of presenters for today's meeting. Uh, I'll have an introduction and a brief project recap for those who may be joining us for the first time today. I'll have a brief report on an event that I had the pleasure of participating in last week in Pennsylvania. And then we will dive into our main topic for today, which is supporting family caregivers. Uh, we have several folks joining us from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, uh, Dr. Jennifer Wolf, Dr. Kate Miller, and Dr. Cheney Fabius. And we have Wendy Fox Grange from the National Academy for State Health Policy, or NASHB. We encourage our attendees to make use of the Q&A and chat functions here in Zoom to share information, ask questions, and connect. And we encourage our guests to take a peek in there when you're not speaking and respond to any inquiries if you can. But keep in mind that some of those questions uh, the entire group might benefit from hearing the answers to as well. Uh, before we adjourn today, I will tell you about our future plans and some upcoming activities this summer. Just a quick recap of how we got here uh, in 2022 with the support of the Commonwealth Fund, CSG created an eight state task force that guided us in the development of our long-term care policy guide published early in 2023. One of the three focus areas that we had for that project, which corresponds to one of the chapters in the guide was revitalizing the direct care workforce and supporting family caregivers. Uh, last year, again, with the support of the Commonwealth Fund, we spun off that workforce focus uh, into its own project. We expanded that eight state task force into a national network of state policymakers and stakeholder groups. We have a website, our National Online Resource Center, which uses that section of the policy guide I mentioned to highlight numerous examples of state policies uh, going on around the country. And we have been offering technical assistance to states that are interested in exploring ways to address long-term care workforce needs. For us, technical assistance has meant sharing examples of initiatives related to our state strategies to revitalize the long-term care workforce, which you see listed here. Each of those corresponds to a page on our website with plenty of policy examples to explore. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see one of those state strategies is supporting family caregivers. On previous webinars, uh, I've told you about a couple of our of those technical assistance engagements with Illinois and Hawaii. And on last month's webinar, we previewed this event, uh, which took place last Friday in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Our friend, Dr. Dan Hemowitz, a geriatrician in Levittown, really championed putting this meeting together and joined forces with the Bucks County Health Improvement Partnership to move it forward. Uh, as a county-based event, this was something a bit different uh, for us uh, uh, at the Council of State Governments, uh, but I think what we have done throughout this project is to cast a wide net for initiatives and programs and solutions really at all levels. So we were pleased to be able to share some of those as part of this summit. Uh, in putting uh, this three-hour meeting together, the decision was made to focus on four of our seven state strategies, including supporting family caregivers. Uh, these four strategies were determined to have perhaps the most opportunities for initiatives at the local level, at the county level, with essential partners like the area agencies on aging. Uh, and as it turned out, this was really a meeting we could have done at the state level or even at the national level, level perhaps as one of these network webinars. Uh, this was a hybrid meeting, so attendees both in person uh, at the Bucks County Community College and online got to hear from speakers from around the Commonwealth and around the country. Uh, that included Jason Kabulik, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Secretary of Aging. He highlighted the recent launch of Aging Our Way PA, a 10-year state strategic plan and roadmap to meet the needs of older adults and improve services for them. Uh, the roadmap includes a caregiver toolkit and a dedicated priority focus on caregiver supports. Uh, Kavulik uh, said, uh, caregivers across the Commonwealth play a life-sustaining and necessary role in the health and well-being of older adults. Uh, in addition to the secretary, we heard from a few folks who will be familiar faces to anyone who has joined us for uh, our previous webinars. Our friend Alice Bonner from the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition gave an update on 
uh, where they are with their action plans and the new round of funding that they're receiving from the John A. Hartford Foundation. Uh, and Kevin Coughlin from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, who joined us for one of our webinars last year, was also part of the summit uh, talking about the innovative WIS Caregiver Careers Program, the Certified Direct Care Professional Certification in the Badger State, and the, the Workforce Development Platform WIS Caregiver Connections. Uh, our discussion uh, on employment supports included James Val Vanderholst, uh, from the Employer Resource Network, who talked about the importance of stabilizing the employee at work and helping them solve life balance issues like transportation, shelter, food, and safety, so they can then focus more on skill development, uh, training, and personal goals. Uh, for expanding the pipeline, uh, we heard about how officials in Bucks County and around the Commonwealth are working to develop registered apprenticeships so that employers in long-term care and other industries can train employees when it may be hard to find qualified people for available positions. Uh, one of the reasons it will be important to expand that pipeline of potential employees uh, for long-term care is that federal and state minimum staffing standards have been uh, issued for skilled nursing facilities, something we heard about from uh, multiple speakers on Friday. Uh, our discussion on supporting family caregivers included Marvell Adams of the Caregiver Action Network, uh, Nancy Fitterer, who ran a caregiver task force in neighboring New Jersey, and one of our guests today, Wendy Fox Grange from Nashby. I won't get too much into uh, that section of the program since we will likely hear about those issues on the webinar today. Uh, the other thing we learned on Friday is that Pennsylvania has a lot of uh, policy initiatives in play uh, in the state legislature right now. A couple of the ones that organizations like the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association and Leading HPA are tracking are these to implement the, the next phase of the Nurse Licensure Compact and to establish the position of medication aid in Pennsylvania nursing homes. So anyway, this was a great event. I know that uh, BCHIP and its partners have plans to focus on next steps after the summit. Uh, there was good participation from state legislators from the region and legislative staff, uh, and they will move forward now to try to strengthen what Pennsylvania is already doing and certainly build on the blueprint of Aging Our Way PA. And I believe uh, Dr. Ha Dr. Hamowitz is joining us this afternoon to say a word or two about the summit. Uh, Dan, are you with yeah. us? I am. Thanks, Sean. That's, uh, that's me in the back, by the way, sitting there in the picture. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the great... The, the great recap, Sean, and thank you for your help. We got a lot of really positive feedback um, from the meeting. Uh, and Kevin, your presentation was also great. I, I just want to, I had an epiphany this afternoon, and I hope it helps the uh, attendees today. You know, the, the long-term care workforce crisis really is a multifaceted problem. Um, and, and I think what we learned is that there are a lot of people trying to do really great work to, to tackle the issue from many angles. But if you're from a state point of view, or if you're going to do one thing, just one thing, what I would recommend is that you try to coordinate the efforts in your state. Because I think a lot of people are doing these things, but they may not necessarily know what other people are doing. So I think that's, Sean, you know, the, the takeaway, and if you look at it, that's what happened in Hawaii. That's what happened in Illinois. I think that's what happened in Pennsylvania. Um, and I just think that's a really good starting point. If you want some more information about... Um, how our program went, what we do again, you know, what worked well, what didn't work so well, I'll put my email address in the chat if you want to contact me. Uh, Sean, you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a, that's a good takeaway uh, from the meeting. Great, Dan. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, certainly being our champion and, and uh, for helping uh, get, get that program across the finish line. Um, and now, without further ado, uh, we want to uh, turn now to the main part of our program and our focus on supporting family caregivers. We want to welcome Dr. Jennifer Wolf, who is the uh, Eugene and Mildred Lippitz, a professor and director of the Center for Integrated Health Care at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, she was also a non-federal member of the RAISE Act Family Caregiving Advisory Council, which issued a state policy roadmap in 2022. Uh, the RAISE Act, of course, required the development of a, a national family caregiving strategy. Uh, Dr. Wolf has also brought along two of her Johns Hopkins colleagues, Dr. Kate Miller, who has led analyses of state policies on family caregivers, and Dr. Cheney Fabius, who works on the interconnection between paid and unpaid caregivers, 
Uh, as I mentioned, we also have with us uh, Wendy Fox Grage from the National Academy for State Health Policy. Uh, Nash Nashby has worked uh, with NACO, U.S. Aging, and others on action guides for counties to develop uh, supports for family caregivers. I'll let them all explain more about their work, starting with Dr. Wolf. Thanks so much for joining us. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, invitation to join this group today. Um, and I will uh, get us started. Um, uh, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, as I, um, as you heard, I'm Jennifer Wolf. If you can turn to the next slide, um, I'm basically going to just kick the session off. And I want to start my remarks by reminding everyone that although we're talking about policy here, the focus is really on people. And I want to emphasize that although family caregiving policy often is segmented by age group or uh, condition that it really is relevant across the life course, certainly thinking about children with special needs, as well as adults with chronic and disabling or mental health conditions or facing recovery from an acute or traumatic health event, as well as um, uh, individuals with age-related impairments such as dementia. Um, if you'll turn to the next slide. I wanted to just set forward a definition um, and to recognize that the ability to distinguish family caregiving from normative interpersonal exchanges that occur within families is not trivial. Um, this is a definition from Family Caregiver Alliance that um, has many parallels to, this, to the definition used in the national strategy to support family caregivers. And it lays out well-established parameters for defining family caregiving including a broader orientation to family than traditionally conceived. So it's really um, family as defined by each person, that help is provided for health and functioning needs, and that the relationship is uh, primarily personal in nature rather than being driven by financial compensation. But this is often um, complicated when we're thinking about state policy and Medicaid policy, especially because um, it is possible for family caregivers to be paid in some situations. Next slide. Um, this is population-based survey data from the National Health and Aging Trends Study. And it demonstrates that the vast majority of care provided to older adults with disabilities is from family caregivers. Here we see in the left panel that two thirds of older adults rely exclusively on unpaid help. About uh, one third rely on both paid and unpaid help and just 5% rely on paid help only. And I'll just note that people who rely on paid help only tend to have the lowest care needs. And those who receive both types of help, both paid and unpaid, typically have the highest care needs. And certainly looking in the right panel, we see that unpaid hours are um, really dominant, that they are nearly six times higher than the paid help um, that's provided to older adults with, with um, disabling and chronic conditions. Next slide. So if we wanna think about policies to better support family caregivers, it's important to first recognize the needs that individuals have um, through uh, care provisions. And this is just a list of the range of types of supports that exist to support family caregivers. And as you'll see, these types of supports are wide varying and reflect the um, many different dimensions of family caregiving. They include information, knowledge, skills, and resources, respite care, reinforcement um, and help from others, coping skills um, like counseling and psychoeducation, helping with problem solving, financial supports is highly important to offset the impacts um, uh, on work um, as well as out-of-pocket spending, and then flexibility in the workplace for the nearly half of family caregivers who are employed. Next slide. And a key challenge is that caregiving is highly heterogeneous. Um, and uh, so too are their needs. So what will help one person may not help another. Um, there is tremendous heterogeneity of caregiving across a range of um, socio-demographic characteristics as well as the care experiences. And um, wh whether, the, whether individuals are managing a new diagnosis, a hospitalization, or challenges around end-of-life care. Next slide. So um, as in identifying a, a clinical course of action, caregiver assessment really is at the foundation of being able to develop uh, effective supports. 
And so this is a, um, a uh, definition put forward by Family Caregiver Alliance in a consensus conference from 2006. I'm old enough to remember being there. Um, it real, this, uh, and it, it defines a caregiver assessment as a process of collecting information that describes the situation about a particular uh, 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 caregiving arrangement. And it, it, very importantly, it approaches issues from the caregiver's perspective. So this is not, an, um, if we're thinking about, for example, individuals being discharged home from the hospital, it is not asking the patient at the time of discharge, do you have enough support at home? It really is talking to the caregiver to understand their perspective and their capacity to be able to provide care. Um, so there are multiple domains, and I will say that these assessments tend to be very long, and they've typically been developed for programmatic um, evaluation for services or for research studies, and there is a very much a need to develop um, more streamlined uh, uh, caregiver assessments that can be routinely deplo deployed in care delivery. Next slide. Um, I just want to also recognize that there are effective interventions that can alleviate role-related impacts. And there's a robust body of evidence typically that focus on a specific condition or circumstance. Um, and that, and th these interventions that work tend to be tailored and multidimensional and really sort of follow on the idea of a caregiver assessment. Um, but there is a very real implementation science bottleneck in that most of the interventions that have been developed have been developed in convenience samples outside of care delivery. And as a consequence, very few caregivers now benefit from evidence-based models. Um, next slide. And this is just a schematic that was developed um, in the consensus report that was um, developed, Ca Families Caring for an Aging America, um, that highlights that interventions um, for caregivers can be delivered at various um, levels, um, from societal levels like public awareness campaigns to reduce stigma, um, or tax credits, organizational level interventions such as um, through employers or um, in long-term services and support settings, social and community um, level like the what we just heard from um, by, uh, in Bucks County, um, Pennsylvania, or at the individual level. And overwhelmingly, most of these interventions have been developed at the individual level. And so these types of conversations that we're having here are very exciting in terms of thinking about how can we bridge the research uh, community with the practice community and think about developing interventions that are really well poised to be um, broadly disseminated. Next slide. And this may be the last slide. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge that um, when we think about, if we think about caregivers as a workforce, um, there's a reality, the reality is that um, the definitions that are put forward really never take into account any notion of preparedness or competency. So if we're thinking about caregivers as the backbone of the long-term services and supports workforce, um, we have a long way to go in thinking about how do we go beyond just identifying that a caregiver is present and understanding um, you know, their circumstances to really thinking about what can we do to better support them in their role in providing help um, in the, in the, in the um, settings in which individuals receive care. And with that, I'm going to turn it over, I believe, to Wendy fox -Rage. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Sean and Dan. Great to see you all again. It was great to be uh, beamed into Bucks County. And so thanks for having me here uh, for, this, uh, for this webinar today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about federal, state, and local um, implementation uh, to better support uh, family caregivers. Next slide. I'm going to go super quick today. So if you want to get a hold of me, this is my contact information. Please reach out. Next. Okay. Uh, just a word about my organization and who I am. Um, the National Academy for State Health Policy, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we're of, by, and about state health policymakers at all levels, all branches of state government. Next. Okay, um, Sean, in his intro, said a little bit about this, but I wanted to go a little bit more in depth about what this is. So, um, boy, it's hard to believe, but about two years ago, 
was the national strategy to support family caregivers was released. And what this is, is it's a very comprehensive plan. And it was developed by two congressional advisory councils. One is called uh, the Rays Family Caregiver Council. There was an act of Congress that was passed for that. Then the second council is supporting grandparents raising grandchildren. And there was an act as well. Those two councils with extensive, extensive input from family caregivers all across the country, all ages, all walks of life, they created this massive plan that ha contains over 500 actions. And out of those 500 actions, and it's all levels, right? It's federal, state, local governments, community-based organizations, employers. But what I wanna point out to you, because of the audience, um, of this webinar, there are out of those total of 500 actions in there, ways we can better support family caregivers, 150 of those actions are geared towards states, localities, and uh, community-based organizations. So really at the community level. Those actions um, are spread across five major goals. So those actions seek to first of all, increase awareness and outreach. So a lot of caregivers don't even identify as a self, as a caregiver. They are a mom, they're a sibling. And so the first thing is self-identification. And then from the caregivers that we spoke with all across the country, many of them just don't know where to turn for services and help. So that was a big, big goal of this strategy. The second one, and Jennifer really uh, went into this, is, you know, the caregivers were also focused on the person we're caring for, that we kind of forget ourselves, and I can relate to this. And so this is having assessments and finding out from caregivers how they're actually doing and what they actually need. A third is getting the services and supports that are needed, because not all caregivers need help, but some do, and they they experience both financial and emotional burden. And so what, what do they need to help them? Maybe it's an aid that comes into the home. We heard from many caregivers that what they most needed was a break, so that's called respite care, or maybe it's something like a ramp that helps the person they're caring for get in the house. So what are ways that we can do that? And there's a variety of strategies. Sean, I know you've spent a lot of work with states working on how can we recruit and ret retain direct care workers. That was a huge need. And there are a lot of um, actions in that area in that third goal, because you can have services and supports, but not without having adequate staff. And these are often the, uh, the workers who uh, make low, lower wages, don't have benefits. So there's a lot that can be done in that area. The fourth one, probably the most um, heartbreaking um, stories that we heard from family caregivers is just the financial impact of caregiving. And so, and, and we also spoke to a number who were juggling their caregiving responsibilities with full-time work um, in the employment place. So again, what can employers do? Um, what can be done financially to better plan. And then third deals with data, research, and evidence-based practices. We've got some of the best researchers on this call. I'm going to skip over that. I think I'm the only one who doesn't have a PhD or an MD on this call. So anyway, I know they're going to talk about some of the great research, and that's super important in this area as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so as I said, it's a very comprehensive plan and there are actually four documents, but people on this call, I think are gonna be most interested in that last one. And that's actions for states, communities, and others. Those are those 150 actions. There's gotta be an idea in there or two that I think you could use in your area. I do wanna point out this plan is on the website. It's on, we work with the Administration for Community Living. It's on their website. It's a part of the federal government. It's called acl.gov slash caregiver strategy. And you can see all of this. 
This is a living document. It will be updated. In fact, Jennifer Wolf, who you heard from right before me, she's on one of those councils. And right now, as we speak, they are working on updating this report so that our strategy is constantly updated. Next slide. Um, here are some of the caregivers that told their stories and um, gave recommendations for actions that are needed within the plan. All of these caregivers are included. Um, we wanted this to be very much a living document. Their stories are included and embedded in the initial report to Congress. And you can hear all of their stories um, on the ACL uh, YouTube page. But we 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 really thought, and then what what's been important in all this work is that it is centered on family caregivers, and you, and as you can see from all these caregivers, and we originally, by the way, we weren't going to include their name, but they all said no, we want you to include our name, and we want our story to be told. We want to be helpful so that we because what you're doing is so important and trying to better the lives of caregivers. Next slide. So this is the center that I uh, direct. It's the RAISE Act Family Caregiving Center. And here you can see the URL is on there. For the state policymakers that are on this call, we have an entire roadmap. It's six papers with all different strategies based off of that national strategy. So for each of the goals, we have papers as listing out the strategies and giving very, very concrete state examples there's a variety. We have webinars, we have meetings, we have all sorts of things. It's all on there. Um, next slide. This is another set of resources because, as I said earlier, even though this plan, the national strategy is a, a plan that was delivered to Congress, it encompasses all of us. It's wide ranging and it's not just a federal plan. It is a national plan that involves us all. So what we did was we worked with a variety of different partners in creating these resource guides that take the national strategy and again, give very specific examples and they're for very targeted audiences. If For the state officials, if you look at the bottom, those are um, very specific examples. If you click on respite care, what are different strategies and what, how have states, which states have done what and what seems to be working. The direct care workforce, again, hugely important. Um, and then in general, kind of overall state policies. Um, Sean, I know you want me to focus in on at the county and the local level. So let's go to the next slide. Um, these are two of our partners. And again, this is off of that supportcaregiving.org website. On the left, you see a screenshot. We worked with U.S. Aging. That's the National Association that works with area agencies on aging, as well as tribal aging uh, programs across the country. Um, I also want to point out that we, we've been so fortunate in our center because it really is a private-public partnership. We work hand-in-hand -hand with the U.S. Administration for Community Living, as well as the John A. Hartford Foundation, which has really made all of this work possible. And so uh, we we thank them and their generosity. Um, U.S. Aging, it's what, family caregiving is one of their highest priorities that this uh, guide contains research that are from the area agencies on aging, as well as promising practices. We also worked with the National Association of Counties, or NACO. NACO also worked with their leadership in providing actions, recommendations, and specific examples. Let me run you through just a few. Next slide. Oh, here. So here's just, a, I'm sorry, this is an example of the different partners that we work with. Everything from the Society for Human Resource Managers, because we, again, resource managers um, working with, you know, employed family caregivers and what can they do. Again, I won't go through all of these, but it just shows you how um, caregivers are impacted in so many segments of our, of our society. And so we were fortunate to work with these groups in writing resource guides. Okay, next. And so that they can reach their membership. Okay, now we're going to get to this. So I think I've really ca ca uh, covered that. That was our National Association of Counties work. Next one. 
And I think I covered that as well. That's the US aging one. And so let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the examples. Okay, so I'm just going to use my county because right now I'm working from home, which is in Fairfax County, Virginia. It's located, it's a suburb just out of Washington, D.C. And what Fairfax County has some very rich caregiver support services, and they make it super easy. So you can get alerts on your phone. Um, if you subscribe, you can get text alerts and information and resources from the area agencies on aging and from the county that comes to you. So again, they make it very simple. Let's from there, we're going to go to Toledo, Ohio, with, and I'm going to talk a bit about their volunteer um, caregiver respite program. So remember, we heard from all those caregivers that said what they really most needed was a break. So in Toledo, they have a program that really um, utilizes volunteers and they stop by weekly with the care recipient, typically like two to four hours ish to provide um, short term respite for the, for the caregiver. And then we know meals and meal planning can really, uh, uh, you know, be, uh, take up a lot of time and effort for caregivers. And so let's go to Douglas County, Nebraska. They have the CHAMPS program, which stands for Choosing Healthy, Appetizing, Meal Plan Solutions for Seniors. And so for senior citizens in that county, they can choose from a variety of meals when, when they want. It's offered daily. It's in six different county locations. And this really is a local thing with grocery stores and restaurants that make that available out in the community. So just a few examples. We have many, many, many more if you click on any of those links. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Kate, who's gonna go into much more detail about the state actions. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, thank you so much for the chance to be here today. And so my name is Kate Miller, and I'm going to walk through a project um, that I, I worked on where I described the landscape of state supports for family caregivers. And um, this project really focuses on the landscape of supports uh, prior to the RAISE Act. Um, and so given everything that Wendy just highlighted, it's really exciting to think about all the actions that will be coming forth um, in the coming years and to think about how this landscape might evolve and change um, to better support caregivers. Uh, next slide, please. Could you, uh, there we go. Thank you so much. So despite their, their key role as providers of long-term care supports for caregivers that are systematic have historically been lacking. And so prior to the RAISE Act, um, the National Academy of Medicine put forth a series of recommendations for state and federal policymakers to adopt to improve supports for family caregivers of older adults by focusing on the health, economic, and social issues facing family caregivers. Um, they also included recommendations to encourage, that encourage states to adopt policy interventions um, that have been successful in other states, as well as uh, they set forth recommendations encouraging private and public partnerships to fund research, um, as well as ensuring that policies explicitly address families' diversity with regards to race, family structure, et cetera, um, when assessing caregiver needs and developing interventions. Next slide, please. So throughout the recommendations that were put forth, there was a really heavy focus on identification, assessment, training, and economic support of caregivers. And so the uh, project team and myself documented and described state supports for family caregivers, and then described how aligned or perhaps not aligned these, po these state policies were with the Academy's recommendations. Next slide, please. So we collected policies from across states. We used multiple publicly available data sources, including but not limited to some of the work from AARP, their long-term um, services and supports uh, scorecard, as well as from the National Academy for State Health Policy and uh, some information from tax credits for um, workers and families. Next page, please. And so some of the state level policies that we extracted and considered included um, state paid leave policies, whether or not they offered flexible sick leave or spousal impoverishment protections, um, whether or not caregiver 
assessment and training was available through Medicaid, and specifically Medicaid waivers, as well as thinking about state level tax credits that went above and beyond the federal dependent care tax credits, and then thinking in greater detail about those tax credits. So for example, are they refundable or not? And thinking about these different types of generosity uh, for each of these policy elements. Next slide, please. And so we mapped each policy to the recommendation components and derived a weighted average using very similar methods to AARP state scorecard, but with some important differences. So for example, in our weighted average, paid leave policies carried more weight than say having a tax credit. And when thinking about policies that were available only through Medicaid, we accounted for the size of the state's Medicaid population. Um, to it when calculating the weights. Next slide, please. And so on this map here, we can see that the states in the darkest shade of blue are ranked the highest, meaning that these were the states that were most aligned with the National Academy of Medicine's recommendations. And while we see variation across states, what this map does not show is that out of a total possible score of 27, where a higher score indicates, again, greater support for family caregivers, we actually observe a mean of 7.2, and the range was 1.5 to 16.7. Could you press uh, the next slide, please? Oh, and then, sorry, one back, just to highlight the red text. Thank you. And so the key takeaway from this slide is that while there are certainly some states that are more aligned with the Academy's recommendations than others, there's still a long way to go for any state to meet the Academy's recommendations. Next slide, please. And so in the interest of time, I just want to briefly highlight one policy that I think really nicely illustrates even the limitations of the existing policies that states do have to support caregivers. So as um, Dr. Wolf mentioned earlier, um, the pop there is a large share of uh, caregivers in the United States, and we expect that the number of caregivers in the US will grow over time as the population continues to age. Next slide, please. We also know that trainings for caregivers are primarily, one of the primary ways they're administered is through Medicaid waivers. Um, and so this is a key source for caregiver identification, assessment and training and potentially payments. But when we think about the training piece, um, it's only available to caregivers of individuals who are eligible for Medicaid. So right off the bat, that eliminates a non-negligible portion of the population of caregivers in the US. Next slide, please. States can then further impose additional restrictions within the Medicaid program about caregiver eligibility, thereby potentially further reducing the number of caregivers who are even receiving training. Next slide, please. And then finally, the waiver budget authority can actually have real um, implications for access. Nearly half the states that do provide training for caregivers actually do so through an authority that allows for the use of wait lists, which can further limit the impact of having training available for caregivers if, they're, if these services aren't accessible in a timely manner. And so this really, I think, nicely highlights the lack of systematic training supports for caregivers and all the opportunities for improvement. Next slide, please. So in the United States, there is one national systematic program that does provide supports for family caregivers, and it's actually run through the VA. So it supports caregivers of veterans. Um, and within the VA, there are also other innovative supports for caregivers. For example, um, nationwide in the electronic health record system, family caregivers can be identified and linked with a veteran. Um, and so the caregiver will have their own like attachment to the veteran's electronic health record so that clinicians can see if there's a, a caregiver as well as add information about their needs, who they are, and potentially connect them with the VA Caregiver Support Program, which encompasses two programs, uh, the Program of General Caregiver Supports and Services and the Program of Comprehensive Assistance for Family Caregivers. Um, both programs offer a number of services, um, which are listed here. I won't read all of them, but they range from um, specific skills training to respite um, to um, navigation. For example, every VA has a caregiver support coordinator, and these individuals play a crucial role in helping caregivers navigate the healthcare, the VA healthcare system, not just for themselves, but for the veteran as well. Next slide, please. 
And the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers offers additional services as well. And these two programs have different eligibility criteria to reflect the different uh, levels of support that are, are offered. Uh, next slide, please. And so in the absence of federal policy, we, we see that states have adopted a variety of policies to support family caregivers, but the availability and level of support varies wildly. And although the landscape of state policy supports caregiver state policy supports for caregivers has definitely improved over time, few states provide financial supports as recommended, um, and benefit restrictions can hinder accessibility for all types of family caregivers. The VA offers um, potential lessons learned for ongoing policy discussions and um, initiatives to improve supports for family caregivers at the healthcare system level, as well as thinking about how to how to roll out supports on a, on a wide scale. And so implementing policy supporting family caregivers will just continue to continue to become more critical over time as the reliance um, well, the reliance on family caregivers as essential providers of long-term care is just expected to continue to grow. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fabius. Thanks, Kate. Um, thank you again for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with uh, my fellow panelists, and thank you for the opportunity to share about collaboration, home care uh, between family and paid caregivers. We can go to the next slide. And so much of my work focuses on the provision of paid care, both via a national lens as well as at the state level. And Wendy um, alluded to some of this in her comments, um, specifically about respite care. Um, but paid care is delivered in home and community-based settings to address the needs of individuals with limitations and activities of daily living, as well as instrumental activities of daily living. It's provided by paid caregivers. Those include home health aides and personal care aides. Um, the delivery um, of, or the goal rather, excuse me, of delivering paid care in the community is to delay or replace the need for nursing home services for older adults and individuals with disabilities, can be provided in traditional community settings um, or residential care settings, such as assisted living, um, and paid services, paid care services are usually delivered through Medicaid home and community-based services, which are administered by states, uh, but individuals and families may pay privately for services. Um, and I also include Medicare home health um, here, uh, because more recently, although it's traditionally understood to be an acute care service, a growing proportion of home health services are initiated without a preceding hospitalization, especially among older adults with dementia. Uh, Medicaid is the largest payer of long-term services and supports. And as a result of rebalancing efforts over the past several decades, many states have shifted their Medicaid financing from being predominantly spent on institutional care to community-based services. You can go to the next slide, please. And so who receives paid care? So this table shows findings from the National Health and Aging Trends Study. Um, it was first fielded in 2011. It has included follow-up interviews, um, resampled in 2015 and more recently in 2022. But of note, if you look at the first row, paid help is used by those with the greatest level of need. Half of the people who need help with three or more self-care activities or self-care activities, which include bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, uh, or mobility activities, indoor and outdoor mobility, getting in, out of, getting in and out of bed, those folks are receiving paid, uh, paid help. Over a third of those uh, with any need with, for assistance receive paid help. And then it's also important to highlight what you see in the bottom row, which indicates the percentage of people receiving help from both paid and family and unpaid caregivers, which leans into the idea of collaboration between these two. Next slide, please. And so much of the work that I have done also um, focuses on uh, paid care recipients who are also living with dementia um, because persons living with dementia are overrepresented in home care. Um, some national studies of Medicaid HCBS home and community-based service data have shown that roughly a third of HCBS participants are living with dementia. In a study um, that we conducted here in Maryland that leveraged Maryland Medicaid home and community-based service assessment data, we found that more than half of the partic participants were living with dementia. And so we examined social engagement and health services use in older adult um, home care participants. 
We did not observe differences in dementia status and low engage social engagement, hospitalizations, or emergency room visits. However, um, you can see that over 60% reported low social engagement. Um, and again, these are folks that are receiving assistance from paid caregivers at home. You can go to the next slide, please. And so um, in the same study with Maryland Medicaid home, um, home care assessment data, excuse me, we found that family caregivers of older uh, adult participants um, in Medicaid HCBS experienced less um, burden than the uh, general caregiving population. Um, however, family caregivers of older adults with dementia were more likely to feel overwhelmed, distressed, or angry, or depressed, or were unable to continue caregiving more often for those without dementia. So it's important to consider that family caregivers of those um, receiving paid help often report managing paid caregivers in the home, including monitoring, training, um, and coordinating care with paid caregivers. And for those caring for people with dementia, uh, family caregivers are typically uh, more involved in that care coordination than people caregivers of people without dementia, which may contribute to what we see here. Next slide, please. Now, less is known about how family um, paid care, family and paid caregivers, excuse me, collaborate to deliver care. So much of my recent work focuses on role sharing, which reflects situations in which family and paid caregivers assist with the same task. Um, and so role sharing may occur through working together to complete a task, such as a family caregiver and a paid caregiver, helping with transferring uh, to the bathroom simultaneously or alternating this responsibility when one helper is not available. Another example of role sharing might be when caregivers are setting up each other's responsibilities, such as a family caregiver leaving a prepared meal for a paid caregiver to deliver. Um, role sharing between care partners and, or excuse me, family caregivers and paid caregivers can be beneficial, but may also impose challenges. While both parties have deep knowledge about who those they assist, uh, misalignment and expectations, gaps in information about older adults' care plans, and lack of shared understanding of each other's roles may inhibit this collaboration. And so role sharing may also fluctuate with respect to specific activities of variable intensity, as well as time demand. So if, for example, hands-on assistance with bathing versus uh, medication reminders. And so the prevalence and nature of role sharing may also vary across features of individuals and helping networks, such as the, such as for those uh, people who are enrolled in Medicaid or those who are living with dementia. We can go to the next slide. And so this is um, some of my most recent work where we conducted um, a study uh, in that data that I talked about, the National Health and Aging Trend Study to examine role sharing um, in older adults. Uh, participants in the survey. So we describe whether among people receiving paid help in the community, they receive assistance with specific tasks from pay, family caregivers only, uh, paid helper only, or both, uh, indicating role sharing. And so this figure shows the distribution of help across each task. Um, and so you can see the dark blue represents uh, receiving help from a family caregiver only, orange is role sharing, and light blue is paid care only. So for example, among the nearly 600,000 people receiving help with eating, 28% did so from both care partners and pay, or family caregivers, excuse me, and paid caregivers or experienced role sharing. Uh, so role sharing was most prevalent for toileting, indoor mobility, um, dressing, outdoor mobility, so on and so forth. It was less commonly observed for medically oriented tasks. So we see that one fifth of older adults receiving assistance with medication administration uh, experienced role sharing. Uh, role sharing was also le least common for receiving help at doctor's visits with only 15% of older adults getting help from doctor's visits um, experiencing role sharing in that activity. But it's also important to note that many received assistance from paid caregivers only, especially for self-care activities. So for example, 52% of people getting help with dressing received help um, with this activity solely from paid caregivers. 63% of people receiving help with bathing did so solely from paid caregivers. And then uh, just to highlight the care partner only, it was most prevalent for those who were receiving help with doctor's visits. You can go to the next slide. And so we also looked at the odds of experiencing role sharing or receiving help from paid caregivers only for each task. 
both for those people with dementia, as well as those who are enroll, enrolled in Medicaid. So this table just looks at the, uh, presents the odds of experiencing role sharing in each activity. Um, role sharing is particularly pronounced if you look at the blue area, arrows for people with dementia, um, the asterisk indicating statistical significance. For example, relative to those without dementia, older adults living with dementia were nearly four times, had nearly four times the odds of experiencing role sharing uh, when, with, when receiving help with eating, so on and so forth. You can see that this is not the case for those who are enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, next table, please. And so this shows um, the, the experience of receiving assistance from paid help only. So you can see that um, those enrolled in Medicaid compared to those who were not enrolled in Medicaid are more often receiving help solely from paid caregivers with dressing, indoor and outdoor mobility. And older adults with dementia um, had lower odds of receiving help solely from paid caregivers with medication administration. Uh, next slide, please. And so I just want to mention something that's come up repeatedly in our work, even when doing the, the work that I just presented, uh, paid family caregivers, uh, both as it relates to identifying them properly in research and policy and what it means to the delivery of paid care. This quote is from a recent set of qualitative interviews that we did examining the experiences of care managers, supports planners, and uh, Maryland Medicaid HCBS who um, help coordinate home care services for H HCBS participants. And so collaboration um, with fam paid family caregivers comes up quite a bit in those interviews. Um, and so it's important to understand the way in which this changes the way that um, families structure care, as well as how families collaborate with other care team members when they are employees rather than unpaid caregivers. Um, next slide. And I know we're, I'm reaching the end of my slides. Just to further expand on this point, this is from a Kaiser Fa Fa Family Foundation report. This is data from a 2023 survey of states' Medicaid HCBS programs. All responding states reported using public health emergency authorities to strengthen their programs by addressing eligibility and enrollment processes, increasing the availability of services, and addressing workforce challenges. And this figure where you can see is circled in the red indicates that some states either ended or in the process of transitioning to permanent or had already made permanent changes to the workforce supports, including increasing provider payment rate for Medicaid, allowing spouses and parents of minor children or other legally responsible relatives to be paid providers or allowing family caregivers to be providers. So as we are talking about the workforce, we also have to consider um, the implications related to paid family who are providing care um, and ind to individuals uh, with disabilities as well. Next slide. So just wanna leave you with a few things as I wrap up to consider. So the first point being about the guidelines that paid family or paid caregivers have for their roles, in other words, scope of practice, because even with collaboration, there are often restrictions on what paid caregivers can do. So some states allow um, uh, nurses, for example, to delegate specific medical care activities, such as medication management um, to paid caregivers, but others do not. So this may limit paid caregivers' involvement with medication administration to reminding care recipients to adhere to medications rather than having a direct role in, in um, dispensing them. Um, the second point is that interventional work is needed to involve family caregiver and paid caregiver ex expectations for services um, and understanding one another's roles um, because caregivers often report disagreements in medication management, for example, with paid caregivers. This might look like additional training for paid caregivers, caregivers to better prepare them for collaborating with families to deliver care. And then my last slide. Um, that paid caregivers um, having hands-on involvement and knowledge of older adult needs warrants greater inclusion of their feedback and care plan uh, development for the individuals they're helping. Um, and in the context of Medicaid-funded home-based uh, care, role sharing is not only affected by the availability of care partners, but care plan guidelines and maximum allowable hours. Um, so that is something important to consider. Um, more information is needed about paid family caregivers who have become a realistic option for care for a lot of people. Information is needed about the size of this unique workforce, their training and support needs, and whether and how being paid to care for a family member shifts the family dynamic and impacts care quality for older adults and individuals with dis disabilities. And then lastly, 
recent federal recommendations identify opportunities for future interventions um, to strengthen the workforce that both consider family caregivers um, and address a lot of what um, my colleagues have talked about today in terms of policy. Um, thank you. Dr. Fabius, thank you so much. And thanks to all of our panelists uh, this afternoon. Uh, lots of great information packed into that presentation. And uh, uh, Wendy, I know, particularly had a number of different uh, resources and reports. And I want to throw another one at, at you. Uh, there was a, another one that came out uh, just this week from our friends at uh, PHI and the National Alliance for Caregiving. It's an issue brief called Together in Care, Empowering Direct Care Workers and Family Caregivers to Meet Growing Demand for Care. So uh, pro probably addressing a number of things that uh, Dr. Fabius was just talking about there. Uh, so I encourage you to check that one out. Uh, we wanna turn now to questions and you can type a question uh, into the chat and uh, we will answer as many of those as time allows. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that we uh, while we wait for those questions to roll in, one of the, the things that we heard from uh, the folks in Bucks County the other day is that uh, individuals who are family caregivers often uh, don't recognize themselves as such, and and so they may not even know about or or, or reach out about support services that may be available to them. Uh, how big of a challenge is that? Uh, it, it, you know, ensuring caregivers are aware that. Uh, these great services may exist, even if they don't always realize that they may be a candidate to, to, to need them themselves. I, I can go ahead and take that. And you're absolutely right. It's a huge challenge. And so we've seen in some of these state campaigns, kind of public awareness campaigns, that many of them don't use then the word family caregiver. They use words that um, people who are family caregiving identify, like you know, have you, are you helping somebody, you know, with X, Y, Z? Are you helping? And so, and we find that with, with um, people in the long-term care world and case managers and things like that, if they kind of stay away from the caregiver, you know, family caregiver label and name more of the activity that they're helping with, then we, we can address, start from there and then address their needs and try to tr try to help out in that in that way. But you're right, Sean, that's a big example. And we all use the word, as you can tell, family caregivers. So I think it's how we, language in this instance matters. Uh, something else that we heard uh, in Bucks County, uh, Marvell Adams from uh, the Caregiver Action Network uh, uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, that often in, in the healthcare setting, a doctor will see a patient uh, who comes in with their caregiver. And of course, the doctor is trained to focus exclusively on the patient. But in some cases, it may be just as important uh, to make sure that caregiver, that son or daughter or family member is doing okay too, and, and is able to make sure that the patient takes, takes their medicine or understands uh, recommended changes in care. Uh, what do you think is needed to sort of help uh, change the clinician uh, mindset to, to consider the needs of both uh, partners uh, in this relationship, the patient and the caregiver? I'm happy to take that on. Um, it's such an important issue, especially in the, um, in the context of individuals who have um, impaired memory um, and cognition, and often that that often is also undiagnosed and undetected. And families are often the um, the motivation for a clinician becoming aware of the um, a memory loss. And so it really is it's it's very challenging in that the lack of attention to families um, has important implications that both erode care quality and also. Um, present challenges for identifying caregiver burnout and that, you know, and being able to refer caregivers to resources. So I think there are a couple of issues that are um, really exciting, in part coming out of the national strategy to support family caregivers, as well as the National Alzheimer's Project Act. Um, and that includes um, the guide model, which is um, being rolled out. It's a, uh, a voluntary nationwide program that focuses on um, and provides uh, uh, a new payment model that includes 
caregiver support as part of that. So there is an identification of caregivers, talking to caregivers to understand their experiences, and then providing respite care um, and, and other, other wraparound services. Also, there is a dementia care planning, which also includes um, explicit attention to the caregiver. So obviously this is specific to dementia care, but I think it presents a model condition on which other types of um, interventions can build. Um, and that includes a range of issues from, um, for example, paying attention to um, who's interacting on behalf of the patient through the electronic medical record and the patient portal. A lot of, there's a lot of work going on in that area um, yeah, so that there is a greater attention, uh, recognition and legitimacy for family caregivers when they're um, uh, trying to um, uh, engage clinicians in answering questions about the patient's um, uh, care, that the, that the clinician knows who it is that they're interacting with, as well as as we move towards um, equality measures um, that uh, where the, the caregiver may be responding in some cases. And I realize that we're at four o'clock, so I'm going to stop talking. Dr. Wolf, thank you so much. And, and uh, thanks so much again uh, to all of our, our panelists for joining us today. Uh, before we go, a, a few quick updates. Uh, if you weren't able to join us for our last webinar back on May 21st, uh, the recording of that meeting and slides have now been posted to the resources page of our website. Uh, last month's meeting was the one where we heard from our friends at Advancing States about lessons learned from ARPA spending plans for home and community-based services. Uh, we hope to have the recording and slides from today's webinar posted very soon as well on the resources page. Uh, if you are not on our mailing list, uh, shoot me an email and uh, you will learn of any new developments on our long-term care work. I'm at sloan at csg.org. Uh, please check out our website, the National Online Resource Center at web.csg.org slash long-term care. Uh, send us any relevant bills or other resources that we may be missing on there. Uh, in August, uh, Advancing States is hosting the annual HCBS conference in Baltimore. I will be there, and uh, so if you see me in the hallway, please stop and say hello. I attended last year, and it's a really great and, and very informative uh, event. And finally, uh, during the last week of August, CSG will be hosting two Medicaid Policy Academies back-to-back -back in D.C. Uh, those are for state legislators and executive branch officials, including Medicaid directors, and long-term services and supports are always a focus on the agenda for those events. Happy to provide more information on our academies to anyone who may be interested. And that brings us to the end of, of this our iteration of our long-term care project. As some of you know, uh, we have had an extended relationship with the Commonwealth Fund. We want to thank them for their great support. Uh, they supported our initial long-term care task force in 2022 that led to the de development of our policy guide, as well as the follow-on project that has allowed us to develop our website and host uh, these monthly conversations. Uh, for the first half of this year, we've had an extension that has allowed us to participate in those technical assistance opportunities like the one in Bucks County I told you about today. Uh, the end of June marks the end of that extension. We are currently exploring another opportunity with the Commonwealth Fund on another project, but we still hope to continue our long-term care work in some capacity as well. Uh, we'll be taking a break uh, from these monthly webinars, at least for the summer months. Hopefully many of you will be on a beach somewhere rather than in front of your computers anyway. Uh, we hope to uh, return at some point to continue these important conversations. Uh, as I said, if you're interested in receiving updates about our future endeavors, uh, please reach out and join our mailing list if you're not already on it. Uh, if you found value in the work that we've done so far, uh, if you want to see these webinars resume and continue, if your state might be interested in exploring any of those state strategies to revitalize the long-term care workforce with us, as Bucks County did last week, and if you'd like to partner with us on continuing this work, uh, please reach out as well. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us today or at some point along the way. Uh, for now, I'm Sean Sloan at CSG Headquarters in Lexington. So long. <laughs>